I was beautiful, uh, Blake. Uh, uh, I go out on my deck at home and I, I sing like that, I sound just like you. <laughs> I know it must be true because all the neighborhood dogs start to howl. <laughs> uh, it's beautiful, it's great to be here. Hope y'all can hear me, I don't know if this mic is picking me up or not. I've got uh, kind of a soft voice and sometimes it gets softer as I go along. Uh, but it's great to be here, uh, beautiful church. What a spirit it is here in this church. You can feel it in, in every corner of the sanctuary here and uh, when we were pulling up it was just uh, it was like it was when I came up here the other day to take pictures it's like coming home when you arrive here. Uh, I came up um, uh, Tuesday. I came up Judy was not with me and uh, Judy is a worst GPS for me and keeps me straight generally and she wasn't with me I had a new phone didn't have GPS on it and I said well I've roamed all over Mississippi and all over Minnesota County all my life and I, we were back when I was younger I, said, I, I can find a way, I know a shortcut. Oh, it's dangerous when you know a shortcut. So I went out there my shortcut on the way to Hernando to meet with Robert Long to do the interview for the Soda Times. And, and I, I wound around, I wound around, I wound around, and I, I finally figured out I was lost. And, uh, so I stopped and, uh, and I saw some uh, fellows there at the country store and I pulled up and they looked at me uh, and they said, you're going where? <laughs> and why are you here? And so uh, they finally got me back on some back trails and I got to Fernando a little late, but I had a great interview and a great lunch and, and um, went to the museum and I toured that, met a lot of nice people. And then Robert uh, gave me directions to get out here. And I assured him that I would not get lost again. Of course I did. <laughs> I took the wrong turn, but I stopped at a house and met a nice couple and we talked about the Lord, so you know, it was probably meant to be. And I got on out here, and just as I got here, you know, the storm was rolling in, and, uh, and the Lord uh, just put all of these beautiful clouds, framed your church and your steeple and everything, and I thanked Him for that, and, and made some pictures, and it was beginning to storm, and uh, I decided uh, I was going to, since I was on Getwell, uh, I knew somewhere up that way uh, was North Point Christian School. And I had been wanting to drop by and see them, and it was running kind of late, but I headed that way and it got a little stormy, and of course I got lost again. <laughs> and I began to feel, uh, you know, I got lost a couple of times, I began to feel uh, a little bit like Jonah, and I wonder if the whale was going to show up and swallow me and take me uh, to uh, North Point. But I got there uh, in plenty of time. Uh, and probably at the perfect time, and, and God is always on time with what He provides for you. And I got there and walked in, there was nobody but the headmaster. That's who I came to see. And I sat down and had a long talk with him. We hope they're going to uh, maybe uh, pick up our books and uh, teach them in um, some English classes, like so many middle schools and high schools are. And one college down in ICC of the Fulton that's now. I know it's required reading in English classes. I know three different instructors who are using the first book. And uh, uh, so, but I was thinking about those storms when I was up here. And I've been, uh, been in a lot of storms in my life. And uh, sometimes, um, or uh, many times, you know, God saved me from certain death. And, uh, but there were times where, you know, I kind of had him off at arm's length. And when the storms came, I wondered where he was. Where was he? Where was he? Where was he? He was right where I left him. He wasn't lost. I was. And uh, so uh, this is kind of our story about that. Uh, I was uh, thinking about kind of a title for this talk, and just as I was thinking that, uh, I got an email uh, from uh, some people at Northeast College. A group of librarians is meeting next month, and I'm there. Uh, their speaker there, and uh, we loved librarians. I don't know if any librarians are here, but um, they help us uh, get the word out, the message through our books, and this is a ministry to us. And a lot of people get their books uh, and their reading, you know, through county libraries and church libraries, and uh, we've been very fortunate. A lot of libraries have picked us up, and uh, Bellevue and Memphis, Adrian's old church, uh, both books are up there, and they can't. Keep on my end. I checked out all the time and uh, just uh, truly been blessed. And so I told him, well, I think the title for that talk will be Writing Nonfiction is Fiction, uh, Digging Up Bones, 
to the past, embracing that pain, and, uh, and uh, remaining uh, true to my faith in a secular world. Because the secular world wanted me to really trash up my first book and, and add uh, bad language to it and uh, all kind of stuff. And then they told me, too, you know, uh, you, might, you might not want to mention God. You may offend someone. <laughs> and I said, and I, and I listed all the bad things they wanted me to put in. I said, this is okay, this is okay. You say, but God's not okay. And I said, no, I can't do that. I said, I'm writing books. You know, to honor him, and if my mother and my English teacher were still alive, I wouldn't be ashamed for them uh, to read my books. And consequently, there's a real hunger for books that don't pummel you with all that stuff that everybody thinks they have to put in uh, their books. And uh, people really like the books, and word of mouth has carried us. But there are so many memories um, up here in, in Hernando, and uh, so I thought, well, I'll title this talk. Maybe from Hernando to Hollywood, uh, lost in the storm, desperately seeking the lighthouse. And uh, I was telling Judy about some things that happened up here when I was very young. We've only been married almost five years. We were friends in high school, and our first wife, Susan, who's passed away, was great friends with Judy. And Susan and I were in her wedding in 1970, and her husband, Jerry, passed away, and the Lord led us back together. Uh, so I tell everybody, I, uh, I, was, I was actually the best man in her, her wedding. So I tell everybody, I've been to both of Judy's weddings. I was best man and bestest man. <laughs> so, so the Lord has been uh, so good to us. And, uh, but I showed her um, some of the uh, historic sites here uh, in my history, just as I did Jim Clemente when he came from Criminal Minds here uh, with me. And we stopped and interviewed in DeSoto County, and they spent some time with us. And, he wanted to see all the places uh, that were in the ghostly shade of pale, you know, written as fiction, but in real life. And so I showed Judy uh, Horn Lake uh, exit. Uh, that's where in 1973, uh, two contract killers from the Dixie Mafia lured me out to kill me. And I told her it looked quite different then. There was nothing there then except an abandoned Gulf service station. And, uh, and of course, over at Bahia in that area, I had uh, midnight meetings with uh, you know, like a former Klansmen, uh, you know, who had information to give us, and then around South Haven meeting with members of organized crime who felt that other members of organized crime had wronged them, and they wanted to tell me stuff, and that's where you got your information. You know, you didn't get the information you needed on Main Street. Uh, you needed the support of Main Street, but you didn't find it there, you found it in the dark underbelly of the world. And of course, over at Walls, that's where we hit that big nightclub as uh, part of the syndicate. And uh, there was Dixie Mafia there, there was some regular Mafia, uh, there was even some of the old crowd from McNary County, Tennessee, the Walking Tall days, had come down. It was quite an eclectic gathering <laughs> of professional criminals. And uh, so we hit them, and uh, we didn't tell anybody we were coming that night, and uh, because they had a lot of political protection that they had paid for. And we'd been watching them for a long time, and. You know, we, uh, we saw even police officers in there doing things they shouldn't be doing. You know, and uh, so we kind of came in on the cover of darkness and surprised everybody. And uh, it was quite a night. And uh, we took a lot of people to the Hernando jail. And that's what they were telling uh, against me for. They got really, really upset about that. And, uh, and uh, my informant had told me that they were meeting, all the factions were meeting to pool their money and decide uh, who they would hire to have it killed. And I said, oh, they're not going to do that. You know, it's been bad for business, you know. And she said, no, they're, they're serious. And, and so when I was on the way up there to meet the people that called me to tell me they would give me information, uh, she called the house and talked to Susan, the first wife, and told her, said, fine, we're all telling us to set up, we're going to kill it. And uh, so we got there, and it was a bad, uh, bad day, big standoff. And, <coughs> And later, we uh, tell you all, uh, we, uh, we found out they, they made a call, too, and they said, after we kill Merle, they told Gerald Chatham, we're going to kill you. He was DA then. And so Gerald started carrying a gun, and that scared all of us worse than the bad guys. <laughs> I thought Gerald walking around with a gun he didn't know how to use. And, uh, and so uh, a lot of memories up here. And, uh, 
you know, that was just a year. I'd only been out of Ole Miss then about a year or so. And uh, when uh, and I joined that first war on drugs that Nixon had declared, and, uh, and uh, just a year earlier from all that happening, I was working solo undercover uh, down in uh, South Mississippi. And uh, I was surprised by some heroin dealers, and they decided uh, they were just going to kill me and take the money that they knew I had and not sell their drugs to me. And so uh, we were out in this house at midnight, looked like every scene of every bad <laughs> B-horror movie you've ever seen. You expected Freddie to jump out with his chainsaw, you know, any minute, and it was a bad situation. And they, they held me hostage with their guns on me and debating where to dump my body or they'd kill me. And I watched them there in the midnight swamp, you know, the moss hanging out of the trees, you know, the owls hooting in the distance, and, you know, uh, the whole setting. And uh, the one main one across from me uh, took out Jolette razor blades and bit them in two and began to chew them. If y'all remember those, how easy it was to cut off the end of your finger with one of those. And, uh, and uh, he, uh, he ate them and he swallowed them. And then uh, grinned at me, blood ran out of his mouth and on his throat. And then they began to uh, he swallowed huge flames of fire. And uh, there was some seriously disturbed people. And uh, a lot of prayers went up that night. I wasn't a big prayer person. I was a very nominal Christian. And I was always, uh, I was uh, probably engaged uh, in the full workspace uh, salvation mode, thinking I could be as good as I could be. And it all worked out in the end, you know, and of course that's not true, but, but that's kind of what I was working on then, and I didn't, didn't understand that personal relationship with Jesus, even though I've been raised in the church. And uh, so that happens to about so many things, and then when I became captain over the whole north half of the state uh, in 1976, we, uh, my men had done a heroin deal, I bought some heroin from dealers in Columbus, and uh, we were going to do a great big deal and do a buy bus we call it, where we were doing the deal, showed them the money, but then we arrested them because we couldn't let that amount of money walk away. We wanted to do a big deal and draw out their backers. And so we had that set up, and I was in my office in Tupelo, and I was running down to my car. Uh, I was always running late as usual. I jumped into my car and uh, Cranked up, put my hand on a gear shift, ready to roll, roll down to Starkville to meet the agents to set up the final parameters of the deal and how close we would stick to them and, and that kind of thing. And just as I put my hand on the gear shift, the Holy Spirit just filled up the car. I had never experienced anything like, anything like that and it terrified me. I didn't know what was happening. It was all around me, it was all through me. And it spoke to me and said, go back and get the bulletproof vest. And it just subsided, out gone out of the car, and I was kind of frightened. And I said, well, "What is that?" I said, "I'm losing my mind." I said, "We don't have any. Well, I don't know where that came from." Because uh, I was walking closer with God then, and I said, yeah, "Well, we don't have any reason to believe it's going to be more dangerous than usual." And the agents didn't like to wear uh, the vest anyway. They were bulky and hard to conceal, even though this was in November. And uh, and they would only in those days all we had would stop up to a 38 caliber handgun. We didn't have any armor in the vest, and that's all about all it would handle. So I said, I'm losing my mind. I don't know where that came from. Put my hand back on the gear shift. Again, the spirit came right back in the car, wrapped all around me, all through me, and it wasn't optional this time. Go back and get the vest. And I said, Okay, okay, okay. I did, went back and got the vest, drove to Sharpville, thinking about what had just happened. I got there, I met with the agents, set the parameters of the deal, and decided, you know, I said, uh, please, uh, I want you to wear these vests to humor me. And I said, oh, we don't wear those vests. You know, they're, they're bulky, we don't want to wear them, we don't need them. And I said, no, humor me, don't ask me why. Just to wear the vest. I said, to keep the deal in town in Columbus, so we'll have buildings and things to have the hands where you stay close to you and listen on the body mics that they were transmitting out. If something goes wrong, oh, it's going to be fine. 
We got over there, they let the deal get away from them. They got out, out, out of downtown, out in the country. So we couldn't stay really, really close to them. And, uh, and I, because I knew what had happened, I was getting really anxious. And they went out on this road south of town and up on this, the road was like a high levee, like this, and deep depressions on either side. And uh, up here was a big, tall railroad trestle. And right in front of it was a clump of pine trees. What we didn't know, they had a sniper sitting right there behind the pine trees with a high-powered rifle guarding the deal. Because there was so much money and so much drugs, the product and them involved. And they were flooding, uh, they were trying to create a market of addicts, flooding uh, Mississippi State and uh, then MSCW, now MBW, with high-grade heroin to addict people. And then they cut the quality on it, so two or three times as much. So we had a lot of product there that day. And, and we were listening on the body mics, and they were cutting in and out. And, and we heard some talk and talk, and then we heard, ta 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 And I looked at the chief of intelligence in the car with me, and I said, Claude, it was, was a gunfire. And then the other agents on the other side of the agents doing the deal said, Merle, they're under fire. They're taking fire. And uh, we came across the levee, and uh, we were caught in the middle of a crossfire, and excuse me, and, uh, and the gun smoke was just uh, drifting over the whole scene, and it was, the clouds had rolled in. I'd never seen a storm like that. It came, a, it came an ice storm that night that froze everything from Jackson to Corinth, and uh, and everybody was firing and shooting and. Uh, and the female agent radioed me and said, Demuros, she said, Jerry is uh, hit bad. He said, bad. And I said, go, 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 go to the hospital. And uh, we finally secured the scene. The sniper fled into the swamp. And I went to the hospital. And uh, when I got to the hospital, I walked in to arrest the violator she had shot. Because as the firing started, he went in to draw his weapon. She shot him right through the wrist as he was drawing out. I arrested him, tried to comfort her, and I walked into the ER, and there was my friend Jerry lying on the table, and they were cutting his clothes and the white vest off of him. The white vest that the Lord had told me to go back and get was now crimson soaked in blood. And uh, the doctor said, Merle, look at this. He said, one hit him in his lower extremities, one round sliced through his arm. This one hit him right in the chest, and it punched through the chest. <coughs> because it wasn't designed to stop a high-powered rifle, but he said it took some of the punch out of it and it deflected it. So it went in behind his uh, uh, right breast and skittered around the barrel of his rib cage and popped out behind his left breast. And he looked at me and I get chill bumps mm -hmm. right now down in my toes as I always do. It was almost 40 years ago. He said, Merle, if he hadn't had that vest on, he'd have been dead before he hit the ground took out his heart and lungs. He'd been dead before he hit the ground. You could almost hear the shuffle of angels' feet around you, Brother Danny. And uh, I knew that we were not alone, and I was not alone. Yeah. But I still, I still didn't quite understand it. Mm -hmm. I knew here we had the favor of God, uh, but I, I still didn't understand it. And I said, well, he's, he's real busy, but busy with people who really need him. Mm -hmm. So I'll just go on and take care of business. And uh, uh, so uh, very quixotic. Always out searching for dragons to slay, you know, the great battles between good and evil and darkness and light. And, and uh, uh, right after that, I was appointed to a big high profile thing in Mississippi. I was, I was appointed to be head of a special internal affairs investigation to investigate a, a corrupt governor and people who were, they were infiltrating, infiltrating our agency with people that couldn't meet our standards. and. You know, uh, in many ways, they couldn't meet our standards. And uh, uh, so we're, that was very high profile, uh, tough investigation in two or three states. Uh, politicians in Jackson, uh, corrupt politicians, I know that shock job. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, interfered in investigation, tampered with my witnesses. And I had to call, threaten to resign, tell them I'd go public. You know, if they called another one of my witnesses trying to interfere and get them not to tell the truth. Uh, so we, we won that battle, but then after that, the politicians um, uh, retaliated. They came after me. 
and uh, and uh, so uh, and what they do is uh, they they know how to uh, they know how to frame frame you they know how to taint you and they wanted to do that so they could come after me because they said well the press likes him he's this goody goody guy and the press likes him so we can't come after him openly so about that time as the Lord would have it uh, corporate world showed up. Uh, the bell system, and I said, uh, uh, we'd like you to come be a security manager for the company. And uh, so I reluctantly left with tearful farewells and went into that, and, uh, and uh, when I left the Bureau, everything behind me was what forms a basis to draw from for uh, Ghost of Shader Pale, and everything from there forward for a while forms what, what forms uh, a ready world. Uh, and I'm ready to redeem now the third and final book in the trilogy. Uh, but I went into the corporate world, found out there's a lot of corruption there. Uh, executives needed somebody to investigate people who were just towed off everything that wasn't nailed down. You know, the stockholders kind of insisted on some accountability. Uh, of course, they didn't want you investigating them. But uh, uh, so I did that, and I went out to other parts of the company later on, migrated from through Alabama over to Georgia. And I uh, got to Georgia and uh, became a spokesman for the company over in East Georgia. Um, you know, uh, the company showered me with lots of awards, uh, which meant less and less as time went by. Uh, and uh, the corporate jet would stop to pick me up, fly me to dinners at Washington at night with politicos. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's another world in Washington, believe me. And, uh, <coughs> Uh, and, and I was chairman of many local boards and, and all that, and uh, you know everybody thought that uh, I was a, a round peg in a round hole, and I was truly, truly blessed. But, but I, uh, it wasn't. Um, I was still searching. I was searching for something. Uh, you know, and the awards and the accolades never did it. You know, they meant less and less and less. Took me the more I'd get, uh, the, the less they meant. And I was straining and pushing. I thought if I push through that barrier of complexity and strain, I'd break out on the other side and there would be the true simplicity and the true peace that I saw that fill up that big hole in my heart. Not knowing all along it was Jesus Christ right there with me all the time. In the midst of that, my congressman, Carl Man, he knew I was a crusader and he called and, and uh, he said, we have this corrupt uh, state legislator and we, we, we want to, to defeat him. We've got someone to run against him that's nice, uh, a young lady. And uh, they said, well, we want you uh, to secretly chair the campaign and to raise money for her and to direct the campaign. Because I had, I had gone into politics on the side and had been President Reagan, State Criminal Justice Chairman back in 1980 for Mississippi. And, and again, part of my you know, save the world mentality again, for forgetting that the world already had a savior. And uh, so I agreed to do it knowing there would probably be repercussions because they were powerful and, and nasty people. And uh, so we, uh, we began to do that and word leaked out who was driving the campaign. And, and one night I got a call from the incumbent. Uh, the incumbent, the same incumbent who had gone around telling a lot of good Christian people what a man of God he was. <laughs> you know, and I'll tell you, I'll be very careful about people in politics. You know, I met so many who would pray with you, quote scripture with me, and the minute you walk out the door, uh, they would uh, malign you. Mm -hmm. But uh, that night he called me and he said, Merle, he said, um, you're back in this woman. He said, I'm going to destroy her. I'm going to break up her marriage. I'm going to break up her family. I'm going to run her out of the state of Georgia. I'm going to destroy her. Destroy her. Destroy her. Kept screaming at me. And then, after that, another friendly call came in from the editor of the Daily Newspaper. And uh, a big newspaper chain that's all over. And he said, uh, we don't want you involved in this. We back him. He's our guy. He's our, our bad guy. He brings money on to us for projects that uh, people want. And, uh, and they said, uh, you know, we've been awfully good to you in the press here. They said, you don't 
do what we say. You, must, you need to remember, we made you, and we can break you. So, well, I had apprehension about that, but to the great crusader who was out looking for dragons to slay, and this was just confirmation. I was finally on the front lines in the battle between good and evil, and uh, so we, I just doubled down again, and the lady won. And she won big, they call it the biggest political upset in Georgia in 50 years. And everything was fine more materially until the powers that be in the political world called my superiors in Atlanta. And, uh, and they wanted my head on a platter. So he's been crying in the wilderness too long. <laughs> and uh, and so they summoned me to Atlanta and it was brutal and heartbreaking. And uh, the company that I love and been good to me and I've worked so hard for her, they called me and said, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are on these little crusades? They mean nothing. They mean nothing. It's only the here and now. And, uh, and they said, you're going to go back uh, home and uh, you're never going to have another thought again. You're never going to publicly challenge any person of power again. And you're going to go back and make money for us like you always have. And uh, that broke my heart and uh, I, I couldn't live with that. And I demanded an early retirement and a buyout and they were shocked that I didn't just capitulate. And uh, uh, there were people calling around. There was a lot of repercussions from all of that. And then my congressman came back and, and, and who had asked me to do all of that with the, with the, with the race. And he said, uh, the new Bush administration is coming in. Uh, he said, I'm going to uh, nominate you to, to be U.S. Marshal. And the senator, U.S. Senator who would have, in Georgia who would have had the final say on that was a friend of mine. But he died suddenly of an aneurysm at 62. And it fell into fighting amongst all the congressmen. And a lot of them weren't too keen on having a guy's U.S. Marshal who had just gone after another incumbent. For after all, they were incumbents, and how did they know I wouldn't come after them, especially if I was U.S. Marshal? And uh, so it, it fell through in infighting and little amount of trips to Washington were going to save it, we finally realized. And so into that vacuum stepped the Georgia Superintendent of Education in a move that changed my life in many ways for the bad and for the good. Uh, but man does a lot uh, that he means for bad, but God is, he makes it good. And his, his purpose is served. Even they don't know. Some people I've seen who were scoundrels, they had no idea what God was using them. And so I looked up at Atlanta. She was the only uh, woman constitutional officer, the only Republican at that time, surrounded by her enemies, hopelessly outnumbered. Uh, the press was all against her, trying to break her. Uh, the state board of education she had was appointed by the governor, who was her nemesis and her worst enemy. And I looked at that hopeless situation and I said, that's a perfect place for her to go to have one great final battle, you know, with good and evil, you know. And uh, so uh, I should have stayed home with my wife uh, and just taken some time with her. She'd been very sick. She'd been a, a, a diabetic since she was 11. And uh, complications were catching up with her. And I've been her caregiver for, for decades. But uh, she said, well, I'll go if you want to go. And so we packed up and got, and got a kind of condominium in, in Atlanta on Peak Street. Of course, everybody in Atlanta is named Peak Street. And uh, uh, somebody said, well, go down to Peak Street. It's like, which Peak Street do you mean? And so we got there and found out it was much worse than I ever could have imagined. It, uh, the dragons were bigger and nastier than I'd ever seen. And I found there that the organized crime figures who tried to kill me were just choir boys compared to the political criminals I encountered and what in the second book I, in Michael calls the unholy trinity of politics, crime, and business. And uh, it was brutal. Uh, and uh, it became, they, they thought she was going to run against the governor, which she eventually did. Uh, and 
but it was a battle every month with the state board, um, uh, and we had leaks everywhere. And I was having my old friends at Bell sweep our offices for wiretaps constantly. Um, uh, state trooper, retired state trooper, called us to a secret meeting and told us, uh, he said, y'all need to be very careful. Uh, the word has gone out for, from high sources through some of the trooper huts that if they would catch y'all out on the road, they're to stop you. They're to refine you. They're to hurt you, put you in jail if they can. And now, would all troopers do that? Certainly not. But would some do it? Absolutely. As a person who's been in law enforcement, I can tell you absolutely they would have. And, uh, and so it was in that kind of environment, it's so much more. One of the other deputies, there were four deputy superintendents. We had to store him out of the building because he was leaking all the information we had to the governor's people. We had to score him from the building. And, uh, and then the governor, who was building in a shadow government outside the legal framework of the Constitution, uh, he was a power hungry guy, uh, like the old boss, bosses of boss politics. And he needed money to, to fund all of that. And he eyed us, and all that money we had coming in from Washington, we had hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars coming in from Washington in education money. But we were the only legal recipient of it by the, uh, the Constitution of the country and the state. And he said he wanted us to divert some of that to him, for whatever he wanted to use it for. And we said, no, we can't do that. It's illegal. So. Uh, so the battle lines were drawn, and then uh, the Assistant U.S. Secretary of Education called me from Washington one day and said, Merle, we, uh, we, we hear what's going on down there, and we're there up here nibbling around at us, trying to bypass y'all to get the money. She said, I'm telling you to hold the line. Hold the line. We'll indict anybody and go after them, prosecute them who converts any of that money. I said, absolutely. Got you. And uh, so then she came to Atlanta with the U.S. Secretary himself, Rod Page, and reiterated that whole line again in front of him. So we did, but then everything changed. I'm telling you how Washington works, it is, it is sordid and it is, it is not nice. Uh, we got a call from a friend deep within the White House who said they're throwing y'all under the bus. Carl Rowe and the people up there decided they wanted to pass No Child Left Behind. I don't know if there are any teachers in here or not. It was a bad bill then, it's a bad bill now, in my opinion. And uh, they wanted to find a Democratic governor to be the only one to endorse it. They made a deal, let him take all the money he wanted, the verdict, to make that deal. And, uh, and then, I'm sitting in my office where all this is coming down and I get the conference call, the conference call. We got, we've got we had a freedom of information request out now trying to draw more and more information out from behind the scenes about this. And um, uh, they told me, Mr. Temple, the conference call is waiting. I said, what conference call? I didn't know there was one. And all these power workers, excuse me, from all over Washington uh, were on that, uh, on that conference call, and they had called to tell me how it really was. They said, the Assistant Secretary and the U.S. Secretary are no longer available to you. <coughs> and uh, we're going to let the governor and him steal all they want to. And, uh, and to make it easier on them to steal it, we're no longer going to send those hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars to y'all. We're going to send it to the state board that he appoints and he controls. Which had no means to receive or disperse money. I'm telling you all this to tell you, you know, that it is it's so dangerous when you go into a war like that and you don't have an anchor and the shield of Jesus Christ. You can lose yourself because it's such a darkness and all that's necessary to lose yourself in the world, which we talk about in these books, is to be turned around once, you know, with your eyes shut and you can just lose yourself and lose your soul. And um, so I didn't have that anchor, and so all of that war came over us, and all the people surrounding us, and 
Uh, the superintendent's car uh, was uh, sabotaged in the parking lot. Uh, lug nuts were loosened on our wheel where a wheel would fall off. I mean, it's just, it's just like a movie, except it was real. And uh, so they, we began, when we saw what was happening, to try to spend the money before they could get to it, to divert it, uh, to do all kinds of things. And, uh, and, and so in the midst of that, the uh, superintendent issued some contracts. And then she lost her bid in the primary to face the governor. And after we, uh, after we left office, one day the FBI showed up and said they were indicting us. Indicting us because they said some of the money in the contracts that she diverted away from the governor so he couldn't waste it and spend it on political corruption that uh, it was uh, some of it had found its way back into her campaign and so they indicted us. And not to minimize any mistakes we made because we were out there trying to, we thought we were the good guys. Uh, but they never indicted anybody for the diversion of tens and tens of millions of dollars and never tried to recover any considerably. So we found ourselves in that situation and it was unthinkable. The last of the Boy Scouts had been indicted, everybody was shocked, and it was just a, a nightmare that wouldn't end. Uh, and I looked at it, and I put, then I realized, I tell you, I realized then, you know, that I had uh, somewhere back there I had let go of God's hand, and I couldn't find him then in that storm. And I realized what I had put at risk, because I had been Susan's caregiver, you know, for decades. And she was not well, and I knew she wouldn't probably live much longer. And uh, so the thought of leaving her was, was overwhelming. And, um, um, and so I looked at the charges they brought against us, and the, the feds today have like a 98% conviction rate. No one, virtually no one, wins against the feds. They have laws that you don't even know about, can arrest you anytime they want to. It is truly frightening for anybody who loves liberty. And uh, so I told the superintendent, I said, you may not think we did anything wrong. I said, I'm looking at this. And I said, they got the laws. And I said, I'm going to go ahead and, and plead and try to get out of this and remain here and, you know, so I could stay and take care of Susan the best we can. And, and she wouldn't plead. And, and uh, then I had a disagreement with the prosecutors. Uh, never liked them. And, uh, the lead prosecutor was waiting on an appointment from the president as a federal magistrate, and he was not too happy with me. And uh, so we had a disagreement, and I uh, contacted the uh, uh, superintendent and told her that, uh, that uh, if she went to trial, that I would tell the truth on the stand about everything that had happened, because after all, by law, I was everybody's witness. And uh, uh, so she then decided, unbeknownst to me, to plead at the last second and uh, told them about me calling her and to keep me from testifying in another related trial and telling the truth. Uh, uh, they arrested me when I came to court for obstruction of justice, they said, and locked me away in Atlanta uh, uh, Correctional Detention Center a horrible place uh, that uh, it's just your, all your worst nightmares come true. They put me in isolation because I was so high profile that they were afraid they would kill me. Uh, and uh, locked alone in that tiny little cell. It was a place where uh, all the, when you're a kid, all the, the goblins and the boogeyman and the, and the monsters you thought were under your bed, they all came out. And uh, but it was there that God broke me. It was there that God took that awful place and he made it holy ground. And I reached out to him. I prayed, you know, like I had never prayed in my life. And then the strange thing happened. The men who uh, had never seen me, because I wasn't allowed out, when they would get out on breaks, they came to my door and there was a little slot in the door. And they came to my door to sit there and look at me through the door. People from the Cubans, the Nigerians, uh, street people, they would come and they would sit there and they would confess their sins to me. You know, murder, 
horrible things. And I'm listening to this and I'm, I feel very inadequate. And I don't understand. And I said, Lord, what is this? What is this? I don't understand. And he showed me that you've been running around trying to save the world and reaching hands out to everybody, reaching down to help people. Uh, but for you to understand and know Jesus Christ and his coming down to humankind, I'm going to bring you down to this world you would have never gone to. This is the well of government, again, taking me to Nineveh, you know, where I did not want to go. And uh, so many things happened there and uh, that were good in the midst of all that ugliness. And uh, I applied for bail again, which no one thought I'd get because uh, the government just hated me. And, uh, but uh, they didn't know the Lord. The Lord showed up, and against all odds, the, uh, uh, the federal judge decided in a hearing that he was going to let him give me bail to go home and be with Susan until I had to surrender, and I knew it was going to be bad. I knew I was going to prison then, and I knew it would be bad because they were very angry and going to make an example of me for crossing the government. And uh, the prosecutor was so angry, he screamed at the federal judge, and the judge was screaming at him holding that gavel up to hit him with contempt because he was waiting on an appointment of federal magistrate from the White House and I, it wasn't making him look good. And uh, so it was just, just a bizarre scene. But I went home and uh, leaving Susan at home was the hardest thing I'd ever done. And I was, felt like I was abandoning my post and uh, it was the hardest thing I'd ever done and very tearful. All recounted in the rented world. And uh, left her in the care of nurses uh, around the clock. And I went in, and when I got to Edgefield uh, Prison <coughs> Camp, everybody was waiting on me. It was a dark December day, and uh, walking up that hill, uh, there were like 500 and something men outside to watch me come up, because I was a curiosity. Uh, they all had seen me in the papers and on TV, and they'd heard the superintendent on TV saying that she was innocent, and, under my spell or something. And, uh, uh, and so they decided, inmates and the staff decided they were going to make it very hard on me. And they did. And it was just uh, just something your brain couldn't process. That, this should never be. You know, this is crazy. And, but I was, I was inside the Bureau of Prison for over 2,000 nights. And they gave me an uh, eight-year sentence. And I'd never spit on the sidewalk. And but they again wanted to make an example out of me. But again, uh, but God was all around. And he began to show me things. And Susan would come to see me. They'd bring her in her wheelchair when they could. And then one day I got a call that uh, she had died early that morning. Uh, she was alone and, uh, at the house. Uh, and uh, they said, uh, you know, she woke up and uh, she looked up and her and her mother had been very close, and her, well, her mother had died of cancer, but they said she looked up and said, Mama, is that you? And then she died. And uh, I can't tell you how devastated I was. And uh, so I asked to finally to go to, uh, to her funeral to be escorted by an officer who was only 30 minutes away. And they said, no, we don't have the staff. And my lawyer said, well, we'll pay for an off-duty officer to escort Merle. No, I'm not going to do that either. So then the federal judge back in Atlanta, he issues an order ordering them, an emergency order, you will take him there. And they appealed it to the federal court, appeals court to run out the clock on me. Just to, to, to go against a sitting federal judge, it's just never done. And it was very personal. But you know, out of that, as crushing as that was, it gave me then standing to go and talk to all the men who were losing wives and brothers and sisters and mamas and daddies, and they were grieving, and I could go up to them and say, I know how you feel. And they knew I did know how they felt. And so then I could talk to them about God. And so out of the midst of all of that, uh, so many things happened. And then the Lord showed me, you know, uh, that he wanted wanted me to write the books. I committed I'd write these books, these three books with his help. And he showed me to start a ministry inside. 
So I started a ministry, which everybody said, oh, you're just an inmate. What can you do? And I said, well, I'm not alone. You know, one plus God is a majority. And uh, so we began uh, the Prison of the Lord ministry inside and began to do, get in Christian movies, which everybody said we couldn't do. We started a Christian movie night. And I want to tell you all, we packed out. We packed out that little chapel. Uh, every week it became the thing that everyone looked forward to. Uh, you know, just standing room only and big, tough men who had never darkened the door of a church. You know, I'd hear them behind me just weeping and their hearts being softened and opened to the person of the Holy Spirit. <coughs> And it became a big, big thing uh, there. And everybody was, and how did he do that? And, and how, is it ha how is this happening? And, you know, we had conflicts with a lot of people who were agents of the enemy who didn't want to see it happen and got into some, uh, some uh, tense converse, uh, confrontations with some people. But uh, one day rolled around uh, that uh, this man who... Uh, had been resisting my invitations to come. I went to him and said, we're showing a good movie tonight, and uh, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, The Perfect Stranger. I don't know if y'all seen it tonight. Great movie to use to witness with. <coughs> and I said, come on, you'll enjoy it. And he said, I'll get off my back. He said, am I about to lose custody of my children? Everybody's against me on the outside. I got to think, I ain't got time for that nonsense. I said, oh, come on. He said, all right, I'll come. He'll just shut up, get off my back. I said, okay. And so he came, we had a big crowd that night, and it was great, and I walked back up. I walked back up the hill, and I was thinking about all the stars at night. I was thinking about everything that had happened. And, and uh, I went back to my room, I sat on my bed, and I was praying, and I said, oh, Lord, thank you for tonight. Lord, why am I here? Why am I still here? And I had my head down praying, and just at that moment I heard a voice clearing. And I looked up, it was that man standing at my door. He wasn't scowling anymore. He was smiling from ear to ear. He said, am I interrupting? I said, no, no, no. He said, oh, Merle, he said, that movie? He said, that movie? I thought there was no way out. But there, sitting in the dark, listening to the words of Jesus, I knew exactly what he wanted me to do. Thank you, Merle. Thank you for staying after me and making me come. And when he walked off, I just looked up and I said, thank you, Lord, because that was a direct answer to my prayer. And that happened many times inside. But I've got to tell you all uh, that um, something else that happened to you when, when I was grieving for, uh, for Susan before we got the ministry really good rolling, uh, when she had passed away, I hit a deep depression. And, uh, and I was lying in my bunk one day and uh, we had little radios and little earbuds. We put them in our ears and if we were, the weather was right, we held them right and, and uh, didn't breathe or whatever, you could pick up a distant Christian radio station that I had begun to listen to, and the Lord had begun to feed me through all those great men on there, and, and that's where I also met, uh, via radio and other means, I met, uh, I was exposed to Ravi Zacharias, a great Christian apologist, who I had a two-hour lunch with in Atlanta, and, uh, Christmas for last, uh, but uh, I was there listening to it that day, but couldn't pick up anything. Nothing but a roaring static in my ears, but that was okay because it was shutting out the reality. I didn't care. I was laying there just wallowing in my pity. And all of a sudden, the transmission went crystal clear. Like I'd never heard a transmission on that radio before. And a voice I'd never heard before, and I never heard again, said, you there. You there. And it was so direct, it startled me. I sat up in bed and I opened my eyes. He said, yes, I'm talking to you. It's not noble what you're doing there, lying there, wallowing in your bed of pity. Now you get up out of that bed and you get about your father's business. And I did. And that's how the ministry and everything else uh, flowed from that uh, came to be. So many stories to tell. I'm writing that third book now. And that prison ministry went on to three different institutions where I was, where I was at in that, my time. It became the most successful inmate-led inmate prison ministry in the history of the Federal Bureau of Prisons. But man meant for bad, 
God meant for good. Amen. And uh, uh, so I went on, and uh, in the midst of that, it, uh, God sent Judy to me. And uh, we knew right away that something was working much bigger than both of us. And uh, uh, so we were married in the visiting room at uh, the, the uh, federal facility in uh, Millington, Tennessee. And I went on to Talladega to finish up. That was the third place we started, the third Christian movie ministry. And at Millington, I was also the Sunday night uh, pastor uh, there. And uh, uh, just so many things happening. And, uh, and back at Edgefield, a man's son was killed uh, playing Russian roulette at 19. And they wouldn't let him go. And, and they were going to have a big memorial service. And he came to me to ask me to, to do the service. And I said, oh, no, I couldn't do that. I can do this other, but I, you know, get up behind the pulpit and speak for God. I'm not worthy. But that was a big turning point for me. And uh, God showed me what I could do, that all things were possible, you know, with him. And, uh, and uh, but I tell you, I just learned so much uh, there. And uh, when Judy and I came home, uh, I started to travel. Well, I sent the manuscript out to Colonel Mize and Jim Clemente in Hollywood. He loved it, said, come to Hollywood. I want to represent you. <coughs> Judy and I loaded up, went to Hollywood, went out to Beverly Hills. And, and we were going to an insider TV show uh, that, that Criminal Minds had set up for us, and uh, we were riding through Beverly Hills, you know, looking at all the, gawking at all the iconic images around us. And I looked at Judy and I said, Judy, I said, we are the Beverly Hillbillies. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, so much has happened, so many miracles we've seen on the road. And when I finish this and have a rest for a while, we may do a book just about all the miracles that we have seen. I mean, true miracles, the cards and letters we get from people. You know, and it's, you know, it's just God kept showing me inside, I have good things waiting for you. Good and faithful servant, I have good things waiting for you. Hang on. And, and so we did. And, and I learned, though, in, in all of that, you know, just how easy it is uh, to get lost in life, to let go of his hand. You know, uh, uh, the book of law, you know, was lost in the temple that Josiah found. Uh, you know, even the, the young Jesus was lost in the synagogue when his parents were off of their Passover ceremonies. And, and, uh, and then when Jesus was with Pilate, you know, Jesus was saying, listen to me. And Pilate answered, what is truth? And turned his back on truth incarnate standing before him. And, you know, I think how little has changed sometimes in 2,000 years. And I tell people, too, that um, I learned this I saw so many people who should have never been in prison and were overcharged uh, and uh, you know, saw homes breaking up. And I, saw, and I tell people, when I hear people being a little harsh sometimes about some of those people and a little broad brushing with everybody, I tell them, you know, we have a bad habit you know, of freezing people at who we think they were yesterday or a year ago or five years ago or ten years ago. I said, aren't you glad? that God didn't do that before he sent his son right. to die for us on the cross. Amen. And sometimes I see eyes open and you know, people kind of get it, you know, and that's what, that's what we're hoping to do. And, uh, but I'll tell you all one quick, I know I'm keeping you late, but when I was in L.A., uh, I was on KKLA, they gave me an hour drive time. It was a God thing. You know, nobody knew me. They gave me an hour drive time on the largest Christian radio station in America, in L.A. of all places to give my testimony. And they asked me, what do you say when, uh, to people who get really dis discouraged when they witness and they witness and they witness, but they don't see any results? And I said, well, I'd say this. I said, we're human. We all want to see instant results, the light go on, and people get it. And right there in front of us say, well, I guess I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. But sometimes it just doesn't work that way. And uh, and I said, and sometimes too, when we think God has us aiming right here, or right here, or right here, it's really someone off on the side who's watching it all. It's really the target that God has in mind, and we may never know it in this life. And I said, Lee Strobel, who was this great Christian apologist, uh, but before that, he was this atheist, and he set out when he was in Chicago Sun-Times to write about Jesus and disprove Jesus. 
funny thing happened, he was converted. <laughs> he became on fire. He came on fire for the Lord. And uh, uh, he'd been witnessing to this atheist editor uh, and who'd been re rebuking him, rebuking him. Get out of here with that stuff. Get out of here with that stuff. I don't waste my time on that. And so Strobel was still at the paper then before he came really famous as an apologist. And uh, one day the Holy Spirit just came on him strongly, like in my car. And said, uh, get up right now, go down the hall, witness one more time, right now. He said, this is a day, this is a day he's going to accept, I've been waiting for this. He runs down the hall, turns in, there's the editor sitting behind a big desk. He said, hey, we've got a great service this weekend, great sermon, great choir, great food fellowship. I know you love it. Why don't you come go with me? <laughs> Burned him to the ground again. Yeah, I told you, get out of here with that stuff. Strobel could not figure it out. How could I have been so wrong? And he just staggered back to his office. But some time passed, and Strobel was bringing a message at that church. And afterwards, people came by to shake hands. This man, his wife, a teenage son came up and he said, we just really enjoyed your message. We just want to thank you for all you've meant to our family. And Strobel said, I'm sorry, but do I know you? And they said, well, not exactly, the man said. A while back, we were in the most crushing period of our life. I couldn't find work. I couldn't put food on the table for our family. We were about to be homeless and out on the street. And he said, I was so desperate roaming the city, and I walked into that big old newspaper where you work one day, and I saw a man there, and I said, you have anything. I'll do anything, no matter how difficult, how mean you I'm desperate. The man said, can you lay tile? He said, I can. He said, you couldn't see me. I was down on my knees behind that man's desk when you came in to witness and I knew you had brought that word to me. Wow. I accepted Christ. My wife accepted Christ. My son accepted Christ. Wow. So I said to the audience today and I say to you, you know, just be faithful and obedient. Don't let go of his hand and God will, God will take care of the rest. I tell you, it's been a long journey, but I took a walk in God's woods and I came out uh, taller than the trees and I walked all the way from Hernando to Hollywood and wound up right here at Grays Creek. And I thank you so much and God bless y'all.